Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Magnus, and I'm an advertising lecturer at Texas Christian University here in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I'm joined today by my co-host, Aaron Harris. How's everybody doing today? My name is Aaron Harris. I'm a career consultant at Texas Christian University, and I serve with the Bob Schieffer College of Communication. Excellent. And today we're joined by uh, Larry Brantley, who is the president of an executive search firm based out of New York called Challoner, uh, as well as serving as the uh, on the Council of Governors for the American Advertising Federation. We're hoping that he can share a few insights for our graduating seniors on how to best prepare for the current job market with everything that's happening right now in the world. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Larry. My pleasure. Glad to help any way I can. Um, for a little bit of background for those watching, Larry started his career as a, a packaging artist, uh, however, has been working in the job placement for advertising and marketing communication um, since the late 80s. So with that, tell us a little bit more about your background and how your role has evolved over time. Sure. Uh, being a, a person with a degree in fine arts and design, uh, Advertising, communications, and marketing has always been something that's been very important to me. So uh, being a, a creative early in my career, but also the sales guy and the marketing guy, I was one of that odd hybrids that didn't quite fit into the pure creative environment. And I ended up working with a lot of friends of mine from college to help them find their jobs. And now almost 30 plus years later, I'm still helping my friends find jobs and including those same people that I worked with when I graduated college, there's still connections and I'm still connected in a career. So career and finding jobs and fits has been something that's been very satisfying for me. Well, that's, that's awesome. Now, I know that you've been doing recruiting through uh, the collapse of the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s and during the great recession tied to the subprime mortgage crisis about 10 years ago. Um, how did those things impact the job market for professional communicators and uh, how is our current situation similar or different? Sure, and um, there's, there are a lot of similarities, and also 9-11 and the Ebola issues here in Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, I think the, the, the marketplace first reaction is going to clinch mode. Everyone kind of holds their breath and everyone's afraid to say anything on what's gonna happen next. So that has been consistent, uh, but what I would say is in this particular situation, I haven't really ever had to be in my home kind of locked in for a while where I can't go meet with people face to face or gather in public events or networking. So that's definitely new. So a lot of the patterns of the, the, the clinch and everyone holding their breath to see what's gonna happen next. And then, and then also who's gonna to emerge to the surface. You'll have people jump out to try and take advantage of the market um, and, and honestly, I, I think there's a certain amount of that that should take place. It's healthy, uh, but then you'll have a lot that uh, are not sure and they'll be fearful and they're going to be really slow to move forward. So Larry, before the interview, we had an opportunity to ask some of our seniors uh, some questions and a common concern of theirs is that they're worried about being actively applying for jobs in the current setting. Um, they don't want to seem like a burden or a, to a company by ruin their chances in applying, applying when companies aren't in the right mindset. What kind of advice do you have for students in regards to applying for jobs during this current climate? What are things they should be looking for and identifying? Uh, candidly, I think they should do just the opposite. Take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, make sure your LinkedIn profile is up to date. Make sure that those work samples that you've been working on are uploaded and ready for people should samples be required. Uh, early bird does still get the worm and the person who's out there invisible will win. Uh, if you play passive and you sit back, um, you may make second or third string. So you can't wait. It's going to be challenging. You're going to have a lot of rejection. It will move slow, but I, from my perspective, I'm looking at some of my team, I want someone who's visible, who shows confidence, who believes in themselves, and therefore wants me to know who they are. Could you, could you go a little bit more in depth? You talk about that online presence. Could you share with students why it's important to have that online presence uh, for employers and recruiters who would be able to find you and find your work as well? You bet. I mean, <laughs> let's look at case in point where we're all at today. We use online 
online video, online screening, online resumes, uh, everything is digital. So if you're not there, you lose. You've got to be visible. And 93% of all recruiters, whether they're firms like mine or with corporations, find their next hire online. And LinkedIn is probably one of the most common. So I, I speak at a lot of schools and when I meet for students, I tell them the things their parents want them to hear. If you're not on LinkedIn, uh, you won't be seen, you won't be visible, and you're gonna be left in the dust. So you've gotta be there, you've gotta be visible, and you've gotta be participating. I'm sure Aaron loves to, to hear that, because he, uh, he tells that to all the students, and so it's good to, <laughs> good to have that uh, echoed there. So that's exciting. Uh, I stand on my soapbox when necessary. It's, <laughs> and it's part of it, it's, and it's not just being there, you've gotta play the game. You've got to participate. It's like if you're going to play basketball, if you're not willing to touch the basketball, what are you doing? So if you want to participate in the job market, you've got to be where the activity is, and it is there, or with recruiters like myself. Absolutely. And to that point, you say, if you're not there, we're not going to find you. And one of the ways that I kind of bring it to students' attention, I tell them, I, and I per se ask, I say, do you use Instagram, social media? They say, yeah. And I say, that's your brand, that's your presence, what's your friend, right? And they always agree, yes. And I ask, what is your brand with employers, right? So you have that online presence with your friends, but you don't have that same online presence with employers and recruiters. And the only way to do it and get yourself out there is to put yourself in those positions. So I definitely push that LinkedIn, that online portfolio resume, um, that digital version of yourself, because that's something that's always going to be there. And if you're asleep, guess what? Someone can still find you on that platform. That's correct. That's correct. And once you're out there, it's all you're connected and you're, you're joining these groups and you're visible. If you're, I mean, one of the talks that I do is specifically when you're going into the job market, you've got to have a clear vision of your brand, your profile. And if you don't know, how in the world am I supposed to understand? So you need to have a sense of, and it's going to change. So don't feel like it has to be locked down of, well, I'm going to be a copywriter. Well, guess what? I thought I was going to be a package designer. Here I am doing recruiting. So things will evolve and change, but you have to start at square one. So by being visible online, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, that's not as critical. The most critical is LinkedIn. Um, and that platform could change tomorrow. I've worked with other online job portals and resume portals and connectors. Uh, it evolves, but today that's where you need to be. So in addition to uh, LinkedIn, one of the questions that uh, a student asked pretty specifically was for um, companies that they had been applying for that are now on a hiring freeze, um, how can they stay top of mind even when there's no jobs available right at the moment uh, with that employer? And so uh, aside from LinkedIn, any other tips on ways to stay engaged and stay top of mind? Sure. I think you, you need to find people who are there. And that could be through Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, I tell a lot of whether you're starting your career or you've been in the market for 10, 20 years, find the person who has the job that you want. And it doesn't mean that you have to you know, knock them in the head and take over their position. But you want to understand how they got there. Uh, what was their background, and you want to emulate that to a certain degree, but it'll give you a lot of clues on what made them successful. So, I don't want to, I'm not representing LinkedIn, so I don't want to go too deep there, but uh, I definitely tell them, find out who is the most senior level person that you have a connection to in that organization, take them to coffee, send them a note, uh, ask them, how did you get your foot in the door? Look at alums from your university with TCU or whatever school you may be representing. Find out if there are alums in that organization who can give you a hand up. Uh, don't be afraid to ask that because quite honestly, once you get into the job market, you're going to be asked for a lot harder things to do. You've got to represent yourself and use those advantages. So reaching out, connecting, uh, doing your research. Uh, you can find so much content on companies or places that you want to work. I would also challenge don't put all your eggs in just one basket as you're starting. Have a handful of about three to five companies that any one of them would be a place you'd be thrilled to be working. Doesn't mean you won't go another direction, but start there. Um, there will be timing is going to play a huge factor on whether you can connect or not, but don't lose focus. I mean, for me, my first job was not with Frito-Lay, but it was definitely a target. My first job was with a vendor of Frito-Lay. I got in there and I learned the business. 
I became responsible for working on that account. So when I was impacted by a downturn in a market and a layoff uh, many, many years ago, Frito-Lay uh, was my, my contact. I called them and they hired me directly. So use the connections, use the relationships, it will pay off. Absolutely, using those connections. Going through this downslide, downturn in the economy right now, how long should students expect or how long should it take for students to get a job under the current uh, circumstances that we're facing? Sure, I think it's a fair question. I don't know that answer. I think if I had to guess based on past historical events, I think if you're proactive, if you're targeting, it's gonna take about six months. Um, and, and that's in a perfect scenario. If you've got a connection, you know there's an opportunity because many of these firms are on hiring freeze right now, uh, as we talked about earlier. Doesn't mean they're not hiring because my business is booming. So I'm telling you, they are hiring, but they're critical roles. They're typically senior communications or um, C, senior executives, CEO, CMO, people who are having to navigate through this crisis. Um, but six months I think is reasonable. Uh, if you find it sooner, um, I think that's good. But part of the reason why I say six months is we're about to go into the summer months where typically there's a little bit of a lull. Uh, most employers, unless they have a fiscal year that begins July 1st, um, they will have most of their head count for entry level hires consumed already for the first quarter. Um, it's just how the business runs. There are always exceptions to it, but know that, use that for your advantage, knowing that third quarter is when they ramp up and they have headcount that they have to use it or lose it. So really start building your profile, use the time for the visibility and connecting, but just realistically six months. Given that wait time that we talk about six months, what are some things that students could be doing in the interim to build their profile as a candidate? You bet. I'm a huge networker. I mean, you have to be in the, in the again, swimming in the pool. If you want to swim, you got to be in the pool. So for uh, advertisers, you need to be involved with professional associations that are tied to advertising. Go to their free events. There's a lot of them. Well, not so many right now. Online chats, webinars, but be active. Uh, join their Facebook, which I know a lot of young people do not. I have three sons who you couldn't pay them to be on Facebook right now. But I'm telling you, the hiring managers are there. So you have to be where they are. Um, but uh, you have to be visible, you have to be seen. Once things ease up and you can get together with people, go to those events. Uh, I'm going to a virtual happy hour this evening and it's seeing a lot of people I know that are connected across the 10th district uh, for AAF. So it's a great way to kind of breathe a little bit and say hello, but you also get insights on what's going on in their community, what's going on with their company, and that's a great way to pick up tips. So to follow that up during the interim time, how do you feel about students doing online trainings, gaining additional certification? Sure. I mean, if I had to invest, if I were in their shoes today, if I did not have Google Analytics experience, I would get it right now, get that certification. Uh, that is a game changer. It can add another 10 to 15 percent on your income potential. And many companies that are tracking marketing automation and demand gen which is not words most advertisers and communications are comfortable with. It's basically the measurements and success of online uh, communication campaigns. So you need to know it. So Google AdWords, Google Analytics, it, it, to my knowledge, it's still free. It takes time and sweat equity, but that will add a good revenue opportunity for your base salary. And it usually is the disqualifier. If you're going into any sort of marketing or communications and even some ad agencies, if it's not on your resume, they go to the candidate who does have it. Okay, so with that, what are the opportunities that are out there right now? I mean, obviously, if you're looking for full-time employment, we're talking maybe six months, but what are your thoughts on like how students might go about building a small roster of freelance clients or finding other things to like, some may not have the option to wait six months for a job. And so what are, what are the opportunities right now? Well, I can tell you from my perspective, I always want to see someone working, period. If it's, you know, working in the grocery store, stocking those shelves that all of us depend on right now, uh, or, or carting things at Amazon, or uh, if it's working for a nonprofit behind the scenes, just taking phone calls, I'd rather see someone visible. If you can make money while you're at it, that's great. Um, but also know right now, 
there's a lot of people who've been in the job market for 15, 20 years fighting for those same jobs. So it's a reality check and it has to be real clear, you're competing with a lot of people. So use the time to build your experience, use the time to position yourself. What I will say is that people who are just starting in the job market right now have more digital online social experience than anyone else in the market. Um, I have a 19 year old son, my Zoom presentation wasn't working so good yesterday, so I called him in as my tech expert. Um, you have an advantage, use that advantage. And I tell people it's not a matter of you have to have all the skills someone's asking for, you just have one more card than the other guy. So if I'm stacking them side by side, make sure yours is weighted heavier. Have you noticed right now during the current global climate any trends as a res in marketing and advertising as a result of COVID-19, specifically with the increased use of social mediums? Absolutely, absolutely. So the industries that are driving me nuts right now because of the activity and volume are tech, anything related to technical, which is like our, our video conference right now, or anything online, digital, social, online content. Healthcare biotech, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have three different clients that we worked with over the years who are working on vaccine solutions right now, which is extremely exciting. So healthcare, biotech. Uh, but the other side is consumer products, food. Uh, Purdue Farms is one of my customers and they can't grow the chickens fast enough right now because everyone needs more food. So focus on the core areas where everyone has a need and I'm sure they're, they're consumer product goods in the TP space, uh, you know, where they're doing quite well right now. Uh, so there are needs and it's quite a few in Dallas, Fort Worth area. So target those companies that have the, the demand in the marketplace, whether it be tech or healthcare or consumer products, they will be hiring. You just have to get ahead of the rest of the crowd fighting for the same jobs. Right. Well, given the global climate, what should students expect in terms of those full-time jobs or even internship opportunities? Like we have, um, you know, our, our seniors are looking for full-time jobs, but internships are, are a challenge right now. And so what, what do you predict that students can predict in the next six months, a year, but even two to three years as a kind of a long-term impact of what's going on right now? I, I think you have to, we talked about using your advantages. Some of the other advantages, because you're just starting, you won't cost as much. So as an employee or a hire, you're, the capital required to bring someone in, the risk is mitigated by the fact that I'm not having to pay that person as much as someone with five to 10 years experience. So use that and make it very clear. Um, I think one of the things prior to this particular episode I saw is people uh, might graduate and were assuming that um, Degrees are awesome. Experience is very important, but it comes down to the individual. So um, everyone would like to be paid a certain salary, whatever that salary may be. You have to be flexible. You have to show opportunity and weigh the training that you'll get in that environment versus the immediate payoff. Um, I worked at that vendor that worked for Frito-Lay and did not make a lot of money, uh, but that experience I learned and the opportunity to deal with all those decision makers proved invaluable because when I went from there, I quadrupled my income, but also my former employer became a vendor who had to come report to me. So it was really sweet. So use those advantages and opportunities. Um, from an individual that's not graduating right now, I think everyone would like to get the talent from an internship. Um, don't feel like it has to be in the advertising or marketing communication space any experience is valuable. So like I mentioned, working for a nonprofit uh, is really good. Uh, quite often, if I see someone with straight A's, uh, but they've never done an internship uh, or even worked, I go to the person who may have a lower GPA, but showed some initiative. I wanna know someone's going above and beyond uh, now. So if I bring them for my team, that's the mindset that I want to work with shoulder to shoulder. So it could be, working at a retail environment once they bounce back. Or it could be, um, again, I, I keep bringing up nonprofits and, and philanthropy because quite honestly, in today's climate, 
it's the heartstrings that matter right now. The people you're getting the most visibility, the most clicks, the most views, it's where they pull at the heartstrings. It's true, we're human beings and we relate that way. Use that to your advantage. Go in and work with a, a big brothers and sisters or uh, one of the scouting organizations, something where you can invest some time and energy that may be easy, limit it. You know, if you're doing an internship, don't, don't give away the store. I'm not a believer of someone working 30, 40 hours a week and not getting paid. That kind of chaps me a little bit. Um, when I bring an intern in, I'm paying them and I'm paying them competitive market rate. Not, their time matters. Yeah, that's something that we, we coach students with quite a bit, talking about how to kind of package your experience that, um, you know, I've, I've had students come to me and I know Aaron's had the same situation where they'll have a resume and they say, well, I was a, a babysitter and I drove kids around and I was like, okay, well, that's, that's, you know, that is what you did, but how can we tell that story in a different way? Because unless you want to drive kids around at your new job, that's not really the thing you want to say, but did you have to leverage creativity? Did you, you know, or did you have to exercise patience and understanding and Okay, well, I don't, yeah, any of those jobs, I think, are, are relevant. Um, obviously, if you can find something in the space you want to go in, even better, because you have some of those directly applicable skills. But um, there's ways to kind of strategically package that experience. And so do you have any thoughts on that? Any key things that you look for? I know at this point in your career, you, you work predominantly with executives, but if right. somebody were to have something on their um, resume like they were a, a short fry cook at Waffle House, right. right? What are the kinds of things that you would advise them on how, how to leverage that and when to remove it once they have other experience? Right, well, and again, from a internships and entry level experience, I tell everyone it's the five year rule. You know, after five years, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the year you graduated. It doesn't matter. It, it's, you, everyone's building towards that, but after five years, it's more about what are you doing today and, and where's your track record. So when it comes to uh, those internships and those experiences, I look for tenure. If I can see that someone, even at an intern level, has advanced and maybe that converted into a full-time position or even a part-time position, that matters. Um, I look to see, you know, a lot of people, they, there's an assumption we don't read names and I can tell when you're working for daddy or when you're working for cousin. Um, and that's not always bad, but I'd like for you to stretch it and, and, and take a risk and work for somebody, even if it's outside the industry. Um, being idle is not a good thing. Um, I, I will tell you, I hired an intern who now works full time for me in New York, who this individual worked four and five internships every summer, which was exhausting for me just to, <laughs> And it was sometimes she had multiple internships at the same time. She worked the morning with one and that's New York. So you have a lot more options, but uh, it, it was exhausting. And then ultimately she worked for us and did an internship for us. She found what she enjoyed. And I saw the drive and the tenacity and someone I could tap into who could grow with my team. And, and I hired her before she even finished the internship. I said, you graduate next year. You have a job when you come, come back. So you mentioned the first five years, right? What are things that you think are the most important for a new graduate to focus on in the first five years of their career? Because I know it's, it's probably not money. You want to make sure that you're getting paid reasonably, but um, mentors, experience, like what are the things that are the most valuable things to look for in an initial job the first few years out? I want to see that you're enhancing your skills. I want to see that you're getting some practical knowledge I really look to see, are you getting exposed to big brands or, or large budgets? Um, so I, I wanna see progression. If you're not progressing in five years, I don't know what's gonna change after that. So at that stage, you'll probably do more advancement, more ongoing, you're coming after uh, learning uh, and experience in a classroom for four years. So you're still in learning mode. I wanna see you're capitalizing on that and continue to grow and expand. I really am not one, once someone graduates, if you get your master's or the advanced degrees, that's great. I, the ricochet thing is usually problematic for me. Um, if you come out to the market and you jump back after two years, um, it's, I wanna know why, and I'm interviewing that person, I wanna know what changed. 
did it freak you out? Did you find out you didn't have everything that you needed and you needed to get those advanced skills? I want to understand that because not that anything's wrong with doing that. It's just, it's a question for me. And whenever it comes up with a question, I want to know why. And I want them to be able to explain it. Um, so, because I also, with, you know, advanced degrees, there's a lot of time and commitment and finance that goes into it. At some point, the piper has to be paid. So jumping back and forth is a question mark. Uh, so advancing their skills, growing within a firm, I want to see that, the, I do want to see the title changes. If you start as an assistant account executive or an account coordinator, I want to see ideally for someone like that, that within two years, they've advanced to an AE because that's a normal progression. Um, if there are five years and they're still an account coordinator, that's a red flag. Um, if it's within a corporation, I wanna see that they've worked with a variety of departments. Um, and I wanna see some team growth. And at five years, I also look to see, does this person have management skills? Are they gonna convert to a supervisor role? So that's what I look for in the five-year window. Okay, and with that, you, um you mentioned like, did they advance within that job? I know that a lot of people earlier in their career sometimes move from job to job to evolve and learn new things. Um, you know, uh, what is your thought, what are your thoughts on that as far as what's, what's an appropriate tenure, what's an appropriate amount of time to move to the next job? What, you know, what's the minimum amount of time before it just, it shouldn't even go on the resume or it raises a red flag? What are, what are your thoughts on that? And this is, you talk to a variety of recruiters, you're going to get a variety of answers, but I'll tell you my, my opinion is in today's market, um, the standard tenure for any level is two years. Um, and it's unfortunate, but that's the standard tenure. Um, for someone who's starting out, I want them to commit at least a year, unless it's a really bad situation, if there's financial jeopardy, if they don't have budgets to cover the cost of the hires, um, then I'd rather you see you jump sooner than later. But for me, a minimum is a, a year because you really, within six months, you don't know anything about the role completely and you need to get that full year under your belt. But if you do jump and move to another firm, which does happen, I want to see you're progressing. I want to see that you're moving in the, a, an upward direction for your career, not sideways or backwards. If it's sideways, it could be because of a different, you're moving to a new market, uh, you're moving to a bigger market or you're moving closer to family. Life takes us a variety of, like right now, life takes us a lot of different paths. But I, I want someone to be able to explain it so that it's logical for me. Um, but also the goal is to grow. The, go the goal is to advance. And you could stay in the creative space and not go into management and advance. Uh, everyone doesn't have to be a group creative director. But I with a, if it's a creative uh, segment, I want to see that portfolio grow. So they're growing somehow. I just, I want to see the advancement. We talk about a variety of experiences. Why is that important to get a variety of experiences as a candidate? We talk about the growth and advancement. What does the variety do for you as a candidate when you're interviewing with an employer? I, I think in my opinion, it helps you conclude or, or get a better sense of yourself. If you're only exposed to one thing and you're only exposed to one environment or one job, um, you really don't have a full picture of what your potential may be. I loved packaging. It was a lot of fun and Frito-Lay had nice budgets, so it was good, but I'm not a purist. I don't live for creative. My client said it sucks, it sucks regardless what I think. Um, in the space I'm at now, I'm paid for that gut instinct on matching the best talent to the job need. I really like it. Uh, and for me, um, like anyone who's advancing their career, you've got to love what you do. You've got to get a sense of fulfillment. So working in a variety of jobs and a variety of companies will give you a better picture of, oh my gosh, I don't ever want to do that again. Or uh, this is exactly what I wanted and who knew? I didn't think recruiting would be what I wanted. One of the questions when I'm talking to more senior executives, which I think is, is important as it relates to people starting their careers, I have them look back over their 10, 20 year career, tell me your favorite job and why. So I wanna see what they learn from it. I wanna see what they gain from that experience. And for someone starting, you're building each of those experiences and it's a great time to, to find out what you do or don't like. 
doesn't mean you need to be in a job forever just to see if I'm, what I'm learning from this, if I'm going anywhere. But it, it's more of a perspective, I think, in a broader um, kind of a 30,000 foot level of, of where am I going, what's next, and what's important to me in, in my personal life. I think, and I guess maybe a little, a little philosophical, but the truth is you need to have that answer because the more grounded you are, the more confident on who you are, what you do, guess what? The more valuable you are to me as an employer. Absolutely, absolutely. And to follow that up, we talk about variety. As a, as a younger candidate, as a new professional, if you can go into a workplace and you're multidimensional, can you tell me how big of an asset that is versus being able to come into an organization and only do one job versus you, you possess a, a variety of skill sets um, where a company could pay someone 70000 to do one job versus you as a candidate, you can do four jobs. Could you talk to me a little bit about that multifaceted dimension, why it's important? Well, and I think it, it is important, but I think it comes down to individual talents. Not everyone, and I've been doing this a long time, can multitask. Um, some people are really good in that one groove and they're solid in that groove, but you try to change lanes and then everyone pays for the cleanup. So I, I think it comes down, to, and that's why it's important for individuals to test the waters and figure it out, but also for people who are managing them. There are a lot of mentors and supervisors and, and employers over the course of their career who will help steer them in the path. I mean, they have to because one, it helps them be productive, but the other is um, it's business. So they don't want their business to fail. And if you've got someone floundering, no one wins. So for the multifaceted roles, I'm one of those, I like doing a lot of things. I, I, I tell people I really love spinning multiple plates. I get a lot of satisfaction from that, uh, but I don't some, want anyone dropping things on my plates. You know, it's like, get out of the way, let me get it done. I know that about myself now, but when I was in my early 20s, just starting out, I had no clue about that. I just knew that I wanted to grow, I wanted to advance. I had certain milestones in my head of what I wanted to accomplish. Most of them revolved around money and family and a home and all those, you know, things that we, we want to have our own place. Uh, but I think as a career path, you need to have a sense of who you really are and who you really are can evolve, can change, but there are certain truths that will be consistent. For me, it was a matter of, I like people. I love interacting with people. Not all creatives are. Um, they prefer to be in the corner, in the back of the dark, doing their thing on their computer uh, or in the drafting table when I started. So finding your core truths and what you bring to the table is tremendously valuable at an entry level or a senior level in determining your worth and, and also selling yourself into a potential employer. I can go in with confidence today and say, here's what I bring to the table. Here's what I'm really good at. Here's what please don't put on my plate because I'm not the best person to execute this. That experience brings all that together. And I'm, I think that's an important piece of it that even though we are smart to be multifaceted and, and knowing, not being limited to only being able to do one thing, I think it's important to be able to do one thing really well better than anybody else. Um, particularly getting into the job market and being able to, um, you know, maybe you're a, a really great writer and you know a little bit about SEO and you can make an infographic and you can do the things, but you have you have something that is that you can really hang your hat on as being kind of your signature skill. I think that's true, uh, but also be open and honest with yourself to know that skill can evolve or you could fall into something that's totally, um, I mean, again, the first time someone called me a headhunter, I wanted to bust them in the mouth. It didn't feel nice. I didn't like that. <laughs> then I realized what I'm doing is matching the best talent to an opportunity that allows them to take care of their family or take that back when you could take vacations or other places. I mean, it allows you to go to uh, accomplish those passion projects. So um, I think that's the biggest thing for all of us, whether you're just starting is don't, don't be so hard on yourself. If you're starting out, I, I wish things were different. I wish it I didn't say six months to find a job, um, but going into the summer months, it's always a little bit slower. The fall will pick up, but we're also dealing with some unknowns. Um, 
on will everyone be back in the office? But using this opportunity to position yourself, determine your brand, and one of the things I also talk about is target now. You know, determine the three to five companies we talked about, but also what things do I think I'm good at that other people tell me? It can change and be open for that change too. I got one final question on my part for you, and this is for students, whether senior, junior, sophomore, freshman, what is the greatest piece of sound advice you could give them as they prepare to enter the workforce? Would you repeat that again? Um, I have one question for uh, any student, whether freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. What is the one piece of greatest sound advice that you would give them as they prepare to enter the workforce? This will sound a little sappy, but it's, it's, for me, it's what is my truth. It's don't, smet, don't sweat the small things. And in the big picture, everything's a small thing. Um, there are things beyond your control. And when I started, I was still, my, my friends and family still, I'm a control freak. I try not to be, but I am. You can't. Uh, I, I can't control what's going on in our city government, state government, national level right now, but I'm impacted by it. Um, so I think giving yourself that peace of mind, it's going to help your health. It's going to help your mental state. And quite honestly, when you can have a sense of, of calm in a situation that's not calm, employers need that. They want people like that. So for me, that was a lesson that was very important and it served me very well, not only in business, but in my personal life. This is all great stuff. And I'm, uh, we appreciate your time and we want to get just one or two more questions in and then we'll kind of wrap up here. But um, uh, I know that you mentioned earlier your involvement, and I mentioned as well, your involvement with the American Advertising Federation. Can you speak to the value of getting involved in these types of organizations uh, now more than ever? Sure. I, I think um, when I first got involved with whether it be the American Marketing Association or American Ad Federation or IBC, whatever club, professional club there was, it was a way for me to develop business. It was a way for me to find out about jobs. It was a way for me to advance my skills. Um, it was also a way for me to get a sense without having to take a job to learn a little bit about some other segment of our industry and whether I liked it or not. So it was a, a way to test the waters it's a melting pot of a variety of skills and experience, and that is the tremendous value. And truthfully, it, it doesn't really cost that much. It's more an investment of time, which if that it helps you advance and make sound decisions, it's, it's really time well spent. For me, I've been involved with AAF for more than 30 years. And as a career, it's allowed me to meet people that I've placed in their jobs. Uh, some of the people I placed in their jobs are now executives or CEOs in corporations and agencies. So I followed those relationships. But it also allows me to stay on trend. The industry changes. Whatever industry you're in is constantly evolving and changing. Um, it allows me to learn as I go and stay relevant in my industry and not become outdated. So they're, they're phenomenal. I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm a big big proponent of all professional associations, whatever path you take. For me, it has been a game changer and it's kept me working well beyond a lot of people who might start considering to slow down. I'm not there. All right. Um, the last question we'll just kind of throw out there and then we'll get to any closing thoughts are, um, you know, with everybody being forced into more remote work roles right now, like, you know, not just students, everybody all over the world. Um, I predict that it's somewhat inevitable that the workplace is going to evolve as a result of this. Um, good, bad, or otherwise, people are going to find out what the pros and cons of what this looks like, some of the reduced overhead potentially, that there's just no way that the industry is not going to change in some way. Um, any tips on how students can leverage their experience during this time right now to work in their advantage to like leverage that experience and taking classes online now and doing these things? How can they package that in a way um, that it actually works to their advantage when entering the job market? Sure. I, I think we talked about technology and having those skills for online, social, and, and using the tools of the trade today. Uh, you're students are already way more advanced. Um, and I think 
whether it's troubleshooting or just knowing what tools are available. I mean, half the challenge is not being able to use it. It's knowing what do I choose, you know, whether it's Zoom or if it's uh, if Skype or Google Hangouts, what do I use? Where do I go? So having some insights can be very valuable to any place you go to work. Um, the other side, prior to this current health situation, virtual work was becoming very, very popular. Uh, keep in mind, I've been in the space and placing jobs. One of the challenges when it becomes a difficult skill set to find, uh, employers, big brands, employers are doing virtual offices where they do not have a brick and mortar uh, building or even a retail or corporate office building space. They go to where the talent is and they build a, a company footprint in that market based around the talent. So that is the trend I definitely see is coming. Uh, all of my staff all have been working virtually since day one. We all have our own uh, smartphones and Wi-Fi capabilities and portable computers, uh, as well as the ability to do Zoom or Skype interviews or whatever the case, whether it be nationally or internationally, day one. And our business is a small one, but we've been able to stay ahead of our competition by practicing the use of all technology and tools. So I think that's something these individuals graduating now can use. Uh, you're ready to go. You, you've worked virtually, you know how to do it. I will tell you most employers, the big issue with not allowing it prior for junior level talent is who's gonna mentor and coach if you're not in the office and they can't guide you and have more direct supervision. Doesn't mean you can't, and that might be that it's one or two days a week that it starts. I do agree that's the way it's going because the cost savings of not having to pay for office space is huge and people will get that. I promise you the people crunching the, the numbers at the end of the day do pay attention to that, especially if the business does not lose momentum or fall off. Um, they're going to focus more and more virtual opportunities. So this has been great. We, we thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. I uh, want to leave it to you for any closing thoughts, if you have any. Sure. I, I think one of the things I look back to is, and again, when I speak to students, I want them to feel encouraged. There's tons of opportunities. This is a weird market right now, and I can't compare it to anything else. Um, but I will say after 9-11, um, things bounced back in about six to nine months where it started really hitting a groove. Um, during the recession, it was really tough because you were competing not just against other graduates, where you're competing against people who had families who were literally taking entry level jobs because that's all that was available. I hope and pray that's not what we're going through right now. I'm, I'm pleased with what I'm seeing in the stock market. I'm pleased with what I'm seeing by industry. So I do see that we will rebound faster, but when that will be, I, I don't know. I think being prepared, being diligent, understand a sense of who you are, what you want, uh, creating those target lists, and then being visible uh, is absolutely critical. The other thing I would encourage all of them is sometimes you just need to have the advice of someone around you you can trust. Uh, they're all welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is larry at challenger.com. Um, I do that with a group, whether it's 25 or 350. Uh, it is who you know. It helps you dodge a bullet or make a good decision. They can reach out to me at any time. Um, I can't promise everything I say is going to be the right answer, but they're going to get feedback and they'll get an answer. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have anything else? No, this has been awesome. This is exactly what I was hoping it would be. Um, gotten a lot of those student questions answered and, and got some great insights. And so, you know, it, it sounds like there are challenges ahead, but it's it's hopeful. And I think that's the important thing to look at is that um, there are opportunities. Uh, you just have to find them or you have to make them, right? Correct. Another thing is yeah. just making the opportunity for yourself. Um, but, you know, with the, the technology we have access to, there's no reason to slow down. You can be taking online certifications and training courses and learning and advancing and um, so I think that's the biggest thing I've taken away is that um, even if you don't find the job you're looking for immediately, don't slow down. Find something to do to to fill that time. And uh, that's I think that's great advice. So 
Uh, anyway, I thank you, Larry, for joining us, and uh, I'll, I'll 